We now come to Faraday, of course, uh, who worked in this building. Here's a picture of the laboratory, and you can see this downstairs. Martin took me around before, and I saw exactly this. Here he is working over in the corner here. Uh, his work is very important. It's in this li I'm leading up to Einstein's synthesis of all of this. It was crucially important because he founded field theory. So we imagine that the universe is filled with this invisible rubber, which supports light waves running through it at 186,000 miles per second. You know, light takes about an hour to get here from Saturn. Uh, Faraday was the first to see field lines, which he thought of as lines of tension in this ether. He took a magnet, a horseshoe magnet like this. I remember doing this as a kid. You put a card across the top, sprinkle iron filings on it, and they line up on these lines of tension. They're like rubber bands. Uh, now, you need, you need sideways forces, of course, also to keep them apart. Here's the North Pole, here's the South Pole. We're looking down on this thing. He could pump, put this in a jar, a glass bell jar, and pump out the air, and the lines were still there. So they were there in vacuum. What are they? What are these lines of tension in this non-existent ether? <laughs> um, he wrote an extraordinary perceptive sentence in one of his letters to Maxwell. I consider radiation to be the high species of vibration in the lines of force which are known to connect particles and also masses of matter together. So he's there leading into field theory for gravity from electrostatics. Um, so he thought that there were lines of tension in this ether which were responsible for radiation. That's an incredible statement for su such an early time. That picture came out of Lodge's book in the 19th century. He discovered another effect which I saw before the talk Martin showed me, the magneto-optical effect. This was just basically that when light goes through certain kinds of stuff, uh, if you put a magnet near it, it return rotates the plane of polarization of the light. Now, why was that important? Because at that time, there was no connection whatsoever between electricity and light. It was Maxwell who explained all that. There was also no connection uh, until Maxwell between electric statics, that's when you get an electric shock in a hotel with rubber shoes on, and magnets. They thought they were completely separate things. So all of that was unified by Maxwell. So this was very important because he wrote a letter to Maxwell describing this, and it's the first experimental connection between light and electricity. Now, I guess you could say that sparks are that. I mean, they knew during a lightning storm that sparks gave off light. But other than that, uh, there wasn't much to connect them. That led Maxwell to a very famous uh, term in his equation called the displacement current. And the symmetry that that gave his equations was a crucial clue for Einstein in his theory of relativity. Uh, he was about uh, 40 years younger than Faraday, uh, but they did write to each other, and, and to some extent Maxwell's work is based on Faraday's experiments. He unified electricity, magnetism, and optics using a mechanical model of this ether. That's the extraordinary thing. He applied Newton's laws to this invisible rubber and got his four great equations. Now, in fact, he got 20 equations, which he put in his book and then promptly died, soon after, and it was an extraordinary fellow called Heaviside, uh, an autodidact who lived with his mother in southern England um, and did nothing but study Maxwell's equations throughout his whole life and write papers about it. He was eventually recognised, and he reduced Maxwell's equations to the four that we teach our students today in electrical engineering and physics departments. He designed the old Cavendish lab, which is still there. He died of stomach cancer in 1879. Now, he never predicted radio. People say that he did, but he was focused on light. Uh, and it was, it was eight years after he died that Hertz discovered radio, and it was realized that his equations could be extended to radio waves that we use for our mobile phones. Radio waves are just light at a longer wavelength and lower frequency. Well, they say that an equation is worth a thousand pictures, uh, so I've given Maxwell's equations here for what it's worth. But more important is this, the mysterious thing here. Really, we think of Maxwell as something of a magician uh, because his mechanical model of the ether is shown here. This is his diagram. He had to have these loop currents circulating to get magnetic coupling. Uh, and to get the coupling directions correct, like gear wheels, he had to put in these idler wheels. What on earth are they? They're vortices in this invisible rubber vortex foam stuff which just happens to the right properties so that it will 
uh, transmit a light wave. He found that a change, by introducing these idler wheels, he, he could make his equation symmetrical, so that a changing magnetic field caused an uh, electric field and vice versa. Um, and that produced a thing called his displacement current, which was his really original contribution to all of this. From that, he could work out the speed of light, because, as I said before, we knew that the speed of a river wave or a or sound wave on a guitar string is the stiffness over the density. And he says in the happiest day of his life was he got this number. He was at his house up near Edinburgh. It's still there, the ruins of it at least. And he got this number when he worked out the speed for lights in the invisible rubber. And he thought he recognised it from somewhere. But he couldn't go home because of family obligations for a month. And he says it's the most frustrating month in his life because back in London he had Roma's value and Fizeau's value for the speed of light. He couldn't find it locally in the library in Edinburgh. So eventually he was able to get uh, the coach up to London and go to his flat in, uh, in here in London and look up his notes and found Fizeau's value was the same as his theoretically predicted value for the speed of light uh, if the vacuum is filled with invisible rubber <laughs> with these properties. <laughs> and he realised then that light was an electromagnetic wave and he had its speed. And that was one of the greatest discoveries in all of physics. So what I'm getting at here is just that these equations he came up with were a kind of metaphor. You see, if you ask what does the field consist of, we, we don't know, nobody knows. Physicists find equations which work. They don't know why they work and they don't know the stuff that they actually represent. We don't know what is an electric field in a vacuum because there's nothing there, it's a vacuum. By filling it with this metaphorical uh, invisible rubber, we get the right answer. It's a deeply mysterious process. Here's Maxwell, he died soon after the telephone had been invented. Maxwell played the guitar, he loved uh, Burns's poetry, he, and he wrote poetry, lots of it, and of course he invented colour photography. His first colour photograph is in the Cavendish Museum. And now the last experimentalist I want to talk about before Einstein was Albert Michelson. He was of a Polish family, he was the first American to win the Nobel Prize. He simply decided to devote his entire life to pinning down and locating the ether, which everybody believed must be there, given by God. Uh, I would say all physicists born before 1900 believed in the ether, in its existence. So the great puzzle for him is why is there no headwind or tailwind due to the Earth's motion through the ether? What he found as a result of his life's work was that the speed of light is the same in every direction. And of course for him that was a great failure. He'd expected to find that light went faster when it was going in the uh, opposite direction, depending on whether the, the Earth's speed, how the Earth's speed was with respect to the, station, the distant stars. So here's his interferometer. It's a clever idea. It's entirely his original, own original invention, a Michelson interferometer. He sent a beam of light. Let's say the Earth is moving this way to the right, then this ether wind, the ether being stationary, would be to the left on the surface of the Earth. He sent a beam of light across the ether, and back from a mirror, and then into it and back on this mirror. And if you think of people swimming across rivers with a current, uh, you'll understand that the time it takes the light to go across it and back is different from the time to go into it and back. So where the two beams meet, he let them interfere, and by that you could tell how long they had the times for the two trips. So he expected there to be a change, you know, certainly six months later when the Earth was going in the opposite direction. It goes in a circle. Uh, and when he rotated his interferometer, it could be swung around about its vertical axis. But he got no result, he published it, uh, he, I mean, he got no effect. There was no change in the time for light across or with the ether uh, th throughout the seasons of the year, as expected. Uh, so he wrote this paper, and you see, this was all sort of consistent with Fresnel's idea that the ether sticks, gets more sticky to the Earth as it gets closer to the Earth and is dragged around with it. He wrote a paper in which the conclusion was there, is no, there was no ether wind. The ether is not stationary with respect to the distant stars. Now, that paper, he thought, 
was a, a, an indication of his failure as a scientist. Uh, he went back to America planning to give up science altogether and he believed that nobody had read his paper at all. He got no response to it whatsoever. Well, it happened that he was seated at a dinner with Lord, the Lords Kelvin and Rayleigh in 1884 and they in fact had read it, they were fascinated by it and Rayleigh in particular took a avuncular interest in this young American and wrote letters to him for the rest of his life. Uh, Michelson went and stayed with the Rayleighs in their grand ho house in southern, south of England. And the two of them urged him to try again. It's because it was so important, it's been described as the greatest negative result in the history of science. So he uh, <clears throat> took a job at Case Western and built a much better interferometer with his friend and colleague Morley. This whole great slab here is floating on mercury, liquid mercury. Uh, and he took measurements when this was rotated through 90 degrees and he took it six months later and he got the same result, nothing. Uh, perhaps just very quickly, I'll interject now, before we start on how Einstein made sense of all of this, um, I'll just say something about the discovery of radio because I became, in writing this book, I became a huge admirer of Heinrich Hertz. I think he was really the most gifted experimentalist of all of these people because the experiments he did were so difficult. He did them in Karlsruhe. He discovered radio. He certainly didn't set out to do that. Now, it's interesting. When he did, they called it invisible light. You see, it was described perfectly by Maxwell's equations, just a different frequency. Maxwell never had the curiosity to ask, would his equations describe waves other than light at lower frequency, and all the way down up to x-rays and down to across the electromagnetic spectrum? Hertz was working also for Helmholtz uh, and he started out with a slightly different aim. Now, what he, here's what he did. It was noticed sometimes that in lightning storms you'd see sparks between the ions by the fireplace. Yeah. So the reason radio wasn't discovered, we have detectors for light, your eye for example, there were no detectors for radio. That's why it wasn't discovered. But Hertz had the idea of using a spark gap as a detector. So here's what he did. He made a spark gap with a micrometer where you could screw down the gap as small as you like, and it was connected to a coil to give it a resonant frequency. In a completely darkened room, he had a machine in one corner making sparks with a little coil, and that would create, as we know, radio waves. He walked around in the dark, looking through an optical microscope at this micrometer gap, he would screw it down until it started to make a spark and the gap length was then the strength of the electric field at that point, the lines that Faraday had seen running between his magnets. And he'd write that in his notebook. This went on for months and months, uh, years in fact. He was lucky because the wavelength just fitted into his room. Uh, he, would, he could create standing waves in, like a guitar string note across the room in this radio frequency field. And he was able to plot it out, and he noticed maxima and minima, just like a, a standing wave on a, which a guitar string, where there's, you know, guitarists tune the instrument by running their finger up to a harmonic position where there's no displacement of the spring. And he was able to map out the standing waves, which he published. Now, that, so he had the wavelength from the number of turns on the coil, uh, Kelvin had published the frequency of that circuit. So the frequency was known, the wavelength was known, he could combine them and get the speed, and once again, the happiest day in his life was when he combined these numbers and got a number equal to the speed of light. He then knew that radio waves travel at the speed of light. 